could go right. Today, I'm going to speak with Wednesday Martin, who has written a compelling, provocative new book called Untrue, Why Nearly Everything We Believe About Women, Lust, and Infidelity is Wrong, and How the New Science Can Set Us Free. It is a wide-ranging gallop through the contemporary culture of women, their desire, and the emerging world of consensual and not always consensual non-monogamy. These are questions, of course, all of us have been asking for decades, centuries, eons. But Wednesday Martin brings to it the research of the present, the anthropology, the science, what different species do and how they do it. She is previously the author of the best-selling and controversial Primates of Park Avenue about the lives of the rich and not-so-famous on Park Avenue. And she's written widely for a whole bunch of publications as well as having a PhD from Yale University, and she lives in New York with her husband and their two sons. I urge all of you to take a look at the book. It really is both new and old simultaneously as a way of examining and re-examining how women relate to their own sexuality, how our culture relates to female sexuality, and whether or not attitudes in this area, which remain more Puritan and then not, are at last beginning to change. So with that, let's go to our conversation with Wednesday. Wednesday Martin, talking about sex and desire, fidelity, and the lack thereof. (laughs) And let's just start with an open question of what led you to write a book about female desire, infidelity, or fidelity, depending on how you look at it. How did untrue come to be? I have a lot of friends who are anthropologists and primatologists, and I knew when I was writing my last book, Primates of Park Avenue, from looking at motherhood through those lenses, that mothers of most species are highly sexual, and that we're really unusual uh, as a species and as a culture that we kind of separate sex and motherhood the way that we do. So that was like kind of the first clue that something interesting and worth pushing at was there. And as I continued to read, I just thought, wow, there's so much that primatologists and anthropologists and sex researchers are discovering about female sexuality that's surprising to me. It'll be surprising to other people, too. And I just thought it would be fun to kind of cross this less available knowledge over to women and men, too, who could really benefit from it. So that's what I usually try to do. I try to cross over social science and make it fun. And it's hard to go wrong with sex. It is hard to go wrong with sex. Well, some people go wrong with sex. Well, at least it's hard to go wrong with sex as a commercial product. As a topic, right. It, you know, it's something that everybody has a strong opinion about or an investment in. And even if people are shy and don't want to talk about it, I think they really do need permission to feel a little less weird about sex, which is one of my goals with this book. So much of what we've told women about their sexual selves is just untrue. And I think that crossing over this social science uh, can help women be a little more comfortable in their skins. At least that's my hope. One question that I thought of when I was reading this and thinking about it was, haven't we been having these conversations in one form or another, at least since the 1970s and in other ways, at least since Kinsey and birth control and the invention of the pill? How come this seems simultaneously so new, right? So many people can, who you interviewed talked about having not thought about many of these questions or talked to anyone about them, and yet it seems culturally, at least in the West, I mean, this is this would be a... I doubt you're going to have the Saudi rights to this book being published anytime soon, although maybe. Um, maybe. Like, why does this seem both familiar and yet new? One of the reasons I think that it seems new is that there have been so many rollbacks again and again. One of the most interesting things about writing this book was talking to women who identified as second wave feminists, some of these women in their 60s now or their 70s, who would say to me, I don't know what happened, but women younger than me are so much more uptight about sex or about sexual exclusivity than my generation was. We tend to think of progress as 
this arrow, right, shooting forward through empty space. And the reality is it's not that way at all. And that after what happened in the 70s, we had Reaganism. We had compulsory abstinence education instead of sex education in schools. We had the AIDS epidemic, and now we have Donald Trump. And so every time we feel that we're shooting forward, we're dealing often with a backlash. And so I think that's part of it. Uh, The reason some of this feels new is that female researchers and scientists are coming into fields where they traditionally didn't have a big presence So primatology, sex research, anthropology are lenses that I wanted to look through. And they're they're disciplines really where women are almost taking over, uh, you could say, Mm. or have been for the last couple of decades. Sex research in Canada, for example, has seen a huge influx of young female sex researchers. So all that is kind of shifting the conversation and shifting people's research priorities and the forms of empathy that social scientists feel or what they're interested in. Um, So some of this really is new, particularly the stuff about female desire, the female libido, the uh, idea that women were more naturally monogamous because of their biology prevailed until quite recently. A biologist named Patricia Gowady tried to replicate a study with fruit flies that we had relied on for probably 60 years to explain differences uh, between male and female reproductive strategies in a lot of different species. And that was just in 2013 that Patricia Gowady discovered that a big piece of the science that we based our presumptions on was wrong. So some of it feels new because it is new. That was a huge moment and it was recent. We only recently discovered what the internal clitoris is and that the clitoris is not just a tiny button. So we only recently had this huge revolution in our knowledge of female sexual anatomy, which is incredible when you think that we put a man on the moon and sent a rover to Mars and mapped the human genome, but that doctors in the United States didn't know until 2005 the actual anatomical structure of the clitoris. We didn't realize that we were simply talking about the tip of the iceberg and not the whole iceberg. Yes, or I like to call it the mouth of the smoldering volcano. Yeah, that's much better than, I mean, given all the negative connotations of ice, I get that that's a better analogy. That's a better, it is. So, you know, that was pretty mind-blowing to me that we didn't even know much about the most basic and important part of female sexual anatomy until so recently. So some of this really is very new. So it's funny, I, between uh, leaving grad school and getting divorced and before I got remarried, I started writing a bit about monogamy and non-monogamy and my own questions about this in the late 90s and found so much intense reactions to this, either in conversation or in writing. Usually negative, not a lot of positive, occasionally positive. Right. And much as I decided I didn't want to spend my life writing about the Arab-Israeli conflict, so I didn't become a Middle East expert, I didn't actually want to spend all my time having a battle about these questions. Right. Do, Do you think it's easier to write about this as a woman than a man, or is it changed, or is it gender neutral, intense reactions? I don't know how much it's changed since the late 90s to be a writer writing about sex, but I do think that there is more interest now in the topic of consensual non-monogamy, for example. I think timing is everything, and I think you were ahead of the curve. And I think now there's sort of more of a groundswell of intense interest. You know, the sex researcher Amy Moores found that we were searching on Google terms like polyamory and consensual non-monogamy many times more than we have been in the recent past. And there's obviously an uptick of interest in shows like Sister Wives and Unicorn Land, shows about polyamory. And um, so there has been 
something of a shift. I think it is still unpopular to write about sex and particularly to be a woman writing about sex. I think there is this feeling that women who write about sex are somehow exhibitionists or attention seekers. You know, that's a little disappointing that we're not to the point where we can just consider that sex is a very interesting topic and that women should be able to write about it without us basically profiling and slut shaming them for it. So I think there's a lot of progress still to be made and I think that you were ahead of the curve. Yeah, it's funny the male the male version of that, right, is that if you write about non monogamy, it's basically you want to get laid or you're trying to excuse bad behavior, right? So that's kind of the exactly. male Exactly. There's this idea somehow that people who write about sex must be almost pathological in some sense that it must be unhealthy to write about sex, particularly if you don't have an institutional affiliate so if you can, I hate to say this, but hide behind being a doctor, say, that's something that our culture can then excuse you for writing about sex. But particularly if you write about sex in any way that's unconventional, um, there's likely to be great fascination and a backlash to I mean, we really saw that, for example, with Nancy Friday. Right. She wrote about women's sexual fantasies in the 70s, and people just really couldn't accept almost that women had sexual fantasies because it would mean that women had a sexuality decoupled from men. And at the same time, though, people made her book a huge bestseller. So I think there's this tension among American readers. They want to hear about it, but they think there's something dirty and bad and there must be something wrong with the writer. So... Fun times for those right. of us who are interested in writing about sex. And you're totally right about needing that kind of institutional background because certainly William Masters and Alfred Kinsey both you know, in the 40s and 50s made sure to secure some sort of academic, you know, that they could say this was all being done as sex research and as doctors just studying the human condition. And then someone like Nancy Friday, who's just a writer, lacks that and obviously gets somewhat raked over the coals. But, right. you know, you, you do talk in the book about some hope that we're at an inflection point. And to be clear, I don't think you're arguing that we're an inflection point that we should all embrace consensual non-monogamy, just that no. we're an inflection point of being more open to a smorgasbord of choices without having a moral opprobrium for column A versus moral approval for column B. Right. But I wonder, I mean, I call this podcast What Could Goes Right because I want to examine things that could be heading in a more constructive direction. We've had a widespread movement toward the decriminalization of certain, you know, low-level substances like marijuana. We've had an, a sudden, if you'd asked 10 or 15 years ago, cultural shift in attitudes towards gay marriage. We have a much more open approach toward transgender. But as you point out in your book, attitudes about monogamy and the lack thereof have gone in absolutely the other direction over the past 40 years from kind of maybe 50-50 acceptance to disapproval in the 70s to, if you'd ask people about pederasty versus non-monogamy, <laughs> the disapproval rates of, in the mid to high 90s are probably close to the same. That's right. In the 70s, the big sin was divorce. And something about like 50% of people in the 70s said that they thought that infidelity was always wrong. So basically half of people in the 70s said, well, you know, it happens. Whereas divorce was really widely disapproved of. Now, fast forward to today, and we have a reversal of that, in which, depending on the measure that you look at, between 80 and more than 90% of Americans say that infidelity is immoral or is always wrong. Whereas under half of them, according to some studies, are saying that divorce is wrong. So now we've flipped and we sort of say divorce is okay, but cheating, as we like to call it, is the terrible thing. I think what is especially relevant here also is the sort of persistence of our idea that when women are non-monogamous, not just that it's wrong, but that it's somehow unnatural and that it goes against not just a cultural script, but a biological script. We have this idea in our country uh, that women 
tend towards sexual exclusivity and that it's easier for us. And the truth of the matter is that the new science and social science is suggesting that women need variety and novelty of sexual experience every bit as men do, perhaps more, and that long-term relationships are harder on female desire than they are on male desire. So my hope is that crossing this information over will help women not so much step out or be non-monogamous, but accept the part of themselves and sort of engender wider cultural acceptance that monogamy is not easy for anyone. And it's not women who are the enforcers necessarily of monogamy or gunning for it. And counterintuitively, they're likely struggling with it every bit, if not more, than men. I mean, in some ways, it, some of what you point to, it's almost like we have an animus against desire as much as we have an animus against you know cheating or infidelity. And in particular, I do think that that's true, that we have an animus against desire. I think that when you peel it back, what really is very upsetting to many people is female autonomy. One of the reasons that studying women who step out or who are openly non-monogamous or who do it on the DL was so interesting to me is I think it's a very telling test case because what is infidelity or the refusal of sexual exclusivity but sort of the most radical test case of female autonomy? And at the same time, it's the most basic test case because it's about what you do with your body. Although we allow for it when a woman's, you know, in her 20s or divorced or single or widowed. I mean, it seems to me the animus is more a woman in a marriage, in a statutory relationship with a man. Or in a non-statutory relationship with a man, right? That even if she's with a boyfriend, say, right. we might really be surprised depending on where we are generationally and where we live. You know, we tend to see more tolerance of this in metropoles, but we might be very surprised to hear a woman say, I'd, I'd like to be in a relationship with you, but I wouldn't like to be monogamous so much, whereas we would expect a man to say that. But, you know, the most basic form of autonomy is what you do with your body. And yes, it is very radical in this culture for a woman to say, I'm with you, but you don't own my body. So for me, you know, it's very easy for people to say, oh, yes, I believe in equal pay. Oh, yes, of course, I believe that women should participate in the political process and hold political office. But we really are pushing our feelings about female autonomy up against the wall when we talk about women who have affairs. And a lot of times, I think, the cultural hostility toward women who refuse sexual exclusivity isn't so much about an animus against desire, but a real reaction against female autonomy and sort of seizing privileges that we think are natural or understandable in men, but have a hard time when women seize those privileges. So that's what made talking to these women and talking to experts about them so incredibly interesting. I think female autonomy in conjunction with a, a relationship with a man, because we do accept a wider range of female autonomy if you're in college or if you're in your 20s and single, right? There's much less of that cultural opprobrium toward a woman experimenting and doing whatever she wants pre-marriage or pre-relationship. I think that women in relationships, you know, and this varies, again, say from college campus to college campus or community to community, but I interviewed women who were openly polyamorous and, and talked about encountering all kinds of bias mm. and sort of dumb think about female sexuality, even in these supposedly enlightened arrangements. But yes, I think that we do tend to think, you know, women in their 20s, we tend to allow them, again, depending on where we live, <laughs> to be more sexual. In the United States, we have this understanding that we have sex and then we settle down. Now, remember, in previous generations, people married earlier. And so they got married and then they had sex, often outside their relationships. 
and that's how they did it. But now, yes, marriage is this capstone thing. You're supposed to sow your wild oats before, and there is some acknowledgement that that young women need to do that too. And yes, then the feeling is definitely, but once you're married or in a long-term committed relationship, all that has to stop. And we tend to think that that will be easier for women. Something interesting to me was that among people in their 20s, the latest GSS, which is the General Social Survey, which is done every year and it's a representative survey of 1,500 adults, and that's been going on for years now. What was discovered most recently in crunching 16 years of that data, married young women outpaced married young men in infidelity uh, in their 20s. Hmm. And I did speak with somebody who said to me, a man who said, well, that makes sense. Men really desire women in their 20s. And I said, that's a great example of putting a kind of distorting lens onto the data, because the other way that we might look at that is women are very sexual in their 20s, and they're conditioned out of it, or they're conditioned out of talking about it um, as they grow older. So we have to consider that possibility as well when we think through these statistics and our presumptions about male and female sexuality. We have to kind of set aside the distorting lens and consider other possibilities. And that's what the emerging social science is doing. The new social science and science is showing us, for example, that our long-standing presumption that men have stronger libidos than women do is untrue when we measure desire the right way. We used to only measure spontaneous desire. And when it comes to spontaneous desire, men in the United States in these studies do have stronger spontaneous desire. But Thanks to a female sex researcher named Rosemary Basson, we realized there are different desire styles. And another desire style is triggered or responsive desire. When we measure that, we see that men and women really don't have significantly different libidos. Women's libidos are every bit as strong as men's. And it's funny, in very repressive cultures, or still cultures that we would consider from the West, repressive sexually, particularly parts of the Arab world toward women, one of the cultural memes there is the reason for that intense social st structure that's trying to contain women physically is the belief that women's sexuality is far more potent and potentially disruptive societally than men's. That's right. And in agricultural settings or post-plow settings, it is potentially really disruptive and it is dangerous, female sexuality. And in some places in the world, there is an acknowledgement of that. Look, containment and constraint and containment strategies take different forms. One of them is denial, right? Saying, well, women have lower sex drives and monogamy is easier for women because they can get pregnant, and so they just want one great guy, whereas men can spread their seeds. So, of course, they want lots and lots of sex. That's one content. That kind of scientific language is one constraint containment strategy. Another containment strategy, as you say, is saying that female sexuality is out of control and that it needs to be brutally legislated and, and controlled. I mean, it's it's strange to me, I have to say, this kind of weird cultural shift toward such intense animus toward, you know, cheating and infidelity, especially given how divergent that is from actual human behavior. I mean, it is definitely true from time immemorial. If you want to know what people are doing, look at the rules that are being made to try to prevent them from doing it, right? No one ever passed a law to prevent something that wasn't happening. So, Right, right. Exactly. I mean, the denial is very intense about female sexuality. And what concerns me is that so many women have bought into it and feel that they're freakish if monogamy isn't easy for them. What we know is that worldwide, female infidelity is pretty normative. There are cross-cultural studies. One woman, Meredith Chivers, who's a, an anthropologist, looked at 133 cultures and said, you know, there's not a single one without female infidelity. And yet what persists is this idea in our culture that women who cheat are somehow, they're not just, you know, violating a social script that infidelity is bad. They're violating a gender script, too, 
um, which holds that all this is supposed to be easier for women. And meanwhile, what we find is that women's rates of infidelity have increased since 1990, whereas men's haven't. Um, we like to think that women only cheat or refuse monogamy if they're unhappy in their marriages, their primary relationships. But in one study, a th over a third of women who were cheating described their marriages as happy or very happy. So we really have yet to catch up with actual female sexual behavior and preferences. And when we look at it in a worldwide context, our portrait of female sexuality is just very different from the way that it plays out on the ground. Obviously, a lot of this is a latter-day version of very old themes. So there's a large religious component in the United States. And so there is often reference to a biblical injunction, right? Thou shalt not commit adultery, one of the Ten Commandments. But what's right. interesting about the context of that, and I'm sure you've, you've looked at this, is adultery two and a half thousand years ago in, in Palestine was not any married person sleeping with someone else. It was a married woman sleeping with anybody. Yes, because the difference between fornication and adultery, I could talk about it more easily in the United States, but in Plymouth Colony, for example, in Massachusetts Bay Colony, it was a much more serious offense for a married woman to have an extramarital relationship with a man, whether that man was married or not, than it was for a married man to have an extramarital relationship with an unmarried woman. And that sounds a little complicated, but when you peel it back, what it means is once we started considering women the property of men, which was just very recent um, through the lens of anthropology, you know, it was yesterday, it was 10,000 years ago. But once we started doing that, adultery becomes a crime not so much of desire, but it becomes a crime that's about ownership and violating a man's property rights. Right. And we're still living very much in the shadow of that. And, you know, you talked about how you called this podcast What Could Go Right because you are interested in positive change. I'm really looking forward to the midterm elections for all kinds of reasons. What's particularly promising is that such a huge, historically unique number of women are running for office. And if you look at the worldwide ethnographic data, what you see is that the United States currently ranks really pathetically on two measures of gender parity that are considered the most important. One is female labor force participation. Worldwide, the United States ranks something like uh, 85th out of 175 countries for female labor force participation. In any case, it, it ranks quite remarkably low. And even lower, something like a hundredth out of 193 countries for female political participation. So on the metrics that really matter for gender parity, we rank very poorly. And especially poorly, you know, those numbers are even more lackluster when you consider our wealth as a nation. So it's really pretty extraordinary. It's going to be very interesting to see what happens in this election, because I am of the belief that if we do have a lot of women as high-ranking elected officials, it will mean that things will shift in the bedroom as well and in our minds about female sexuality. Um, if women are autonomous in terms of political and labor force participation, it is very likely that that will be accompanied by a shift in our notions about female sexual autonomy. So I do think that with the upcoming midterm elections, as well as us being in this Me Too moment, when women are sort of insisting on decoupling female desire from male desire and saying these aren't necessarily the same things. Women don't want always what men want to do to them. I think those two factors coming together, it's going to be very interesting um, to see whether we finally get to a place where we're thinking about female-centered desire. And, you know, if women do have more political autonomy in this country with the midterm elections and after Me Too, it'll be very interesting to see whether we're willing to grant women sexual autonomy, not 
in the sense of tolerating them cheating, but in the sense of acknowledging that women, too, need sexual adventure. And I wonder if women, if things change in the election, I wonder if women will develop a more healthy sense of sexual entitlement, entitlement to sexual pleasure that historically we've seen more often among men. We'll see how the elections actually go first. None of this will end in either scenario, whether or not all these women who are running do well or don't do so well. I think these are obviously trends that are going to be more in play in the years ahead. I mean, I look with fascination about whether or not cultural attitudes begin to shift, whether that follows some of these structures or not is an interesting question. Yeah, what we know is that when we look at the worldwide ethnographic data, where women make significant contributions to subsistence, uh, where they have a political voice and where they basically are working. You know, it's hard to raise your hand against a woman who feeds you, the saying goes. It's also hard to legislate the sexuality of a woman who's in charge. So we do know when we look at it in comparative perspective um, that when the political and economic fates of women shift, things improve for them on all measures of autonomy, including sexual autonomy. But you're right, we'll, we'll wait and see what happens with this election. And, you know, the United States in particular has proven strangely immune to some of the, the trends that we've helped put in play globally in terms of our own attitudes about the role of women in modernity, which, as you note, are strangely kind of lag, even though we have tended to lead in so many areas from, you know, creating the technologies that help all genders become more liberated from the basic grinds that have tethered human beings from time immemorial. And, you know, we've proven somewhat immune to our own economic success. It may be that there is progress over time, but right. we're very much in a kind of two-step forward, one-step back pattern. At least we hope it's one step back and not three steps and, back. Yeah, we are. And there's a real arrogance in this country. Um, we tell women this is a great place to be a woman. But in 2017, Index Mundi, using a number of metrics to assess gender parity worldwide, rated the United States below Kazakhstan and Algeria for gender equality. Some of the metrics they used included maternal mortality rates and labor force and political participation. So we have this certain easy presumption in our country that women here are very emancipated. But when we look at the data, we see that that is not the case comparatively. And I think when we look to our attitudes about female sexual autonomy, the most radical test case of that being female infidelity, we see that we really don't like it. David Lay, who studies female infidelity... I love the last name. Yeah, David Lay, right? Yeah. L-E-Y. Yeah, okay. um, but he studies female infidelity. He's a social psychologist, and he has discovered most cases of domestic violence stem from not just female infidelity, but the suspicion of it, even the suspicion of it is enough to unleash domestic violence. And even, you know, women exercising bodily autonomy by, by committing infidelity are subjected to lethal violence other than school shootings. Um, one of the main motivators, if you will, for mass shootings in this country over the last decades has been men going after women who have left them. There are lethal consequences to autonomy for women in this country, and it's not something we think about a lot or are comfortable considering. This presumption that women in the United States are sexually free, I consider to be untrue. Well, that is definitely another angle to all of this, which is sort of puncturing our own easy myths about ourselves, including, as you talk about, the myth about female sexuality that we've told ourselves for years, that you're obviously showing is at least an incomplete story, if not a completely untrue story. So final question as we wrap up. I do gather you've become more somewhat hopeful about the arc of all this, but a personal question to end it, just because mm -hmm. I think everybody's curious, and I know you've written about it. How did writing all this and thinking about all this change your own relationship with your husband? Well, when I started writing this book, I had been married for 15 years and uh, happily married, very happily married. Um, but part of my motivation to write this book was personal because after 15 happy years of marriage and having been what I describe as a disaster at monogamy in my 20s before I got married, 
I looked at my happy marriage and I said, is this, is monogamy going to work for me and my husband for the rest of our married lives together? Because I certainly didn't want to end my marriage. And I was hearing similar rumblings from people that I knew. So I figured that if I, you know, looked to the data, I would get a good sense really about, you know, what is the evolutionary prehistory of pair bonding? What can I learn from other species about it? What can I learn about the evolutionary script of female sexuality? And how can this help me in my own conundrums? And really what I found was so basic, which was just that researching this book, talking to my husband about what I was learning, opened up a conversation that had felt so impossible to have. Think about the number of Americans who get married or enter into a serious relationship. Many of us heterosexual um, because gay men sort of gentrified consensual non-monogamy before the rest of us tacked a name on it. For a long time, gay men have been sort of pioneering open relationships and ingenious arrangements. Um, But for heterosexual people in the United States, most of us still enter into serious relationships without a discussion about monogamy. It doesn't even come up. And to bring it up for me personally in my marriage made me and my husband new to each other. Again, when you're married to somebody for many years, you think that you know that person. Opening up a conversation like this was just a great way to see each other anew again. So I I recommend it. I know that every woman's circumstances are different. For some women, there would be lethal consequences to even talk about non-monogamy. But for those of us who have the privilege of doing it, conversations about whether this is what we want and whether it's working for us. And of course, in the book, I get into all kinds of Solutions for women who crave variety and novelty and sexual adventure, solutions other than stepping out, other than opening up your marriage. Um, There are many other approaches, and I I get into them in Untrue. But yes, I can say that it, it improved my marriage to have a talk about monogamy rather than just presuming that it was the best thing for us forever. It is always good to try to be as open and transparent as possible, albeit often terrifying. So... Good. That's right. If you have the if you have the privilege that you can have these conversations, it is worth it according to most of the people that I interviewed to take that step and take a deep breath before you take that plunge. <laughs> okay. Anyway, congratulations on the book. I'm sure there will be lots of conversation. Hopefully this will be the opener to more of it and its own way of shifting our collective conversation, which is, after all, why one writes a book like this in the first place. So I I trust that this will be a step in the direction of accepting more of who we are, sexually and culturally. Let's hope. And uh, good luck. Thanks for having me on, Zach. I trust you've enjoyed that stimulating conversation with Wednesday Martin. Again, her book is Untrue, Why Nearly Everything We Believe About Women, Lust, and Infidelity is Wrong, and How the New Science Can Set Us Free. It is definitely worth a read. Obviously, we only touched on brief parts of it, and there's a lot more about the science of female desire, about how that has been illuminated by the look at bonobos, by other species, by other cultures. And it does remain an open, and I hope open in a good way, question whether or not our cultural attitudes about sex and about fidelity will begin to loosen. Not to say that everybody should embrace a norm of consensual non-monogamy, but that perhaps we should all be able to embrace a multiplicity of norms with more openness and acceptance rather than forcing everyone into a very rigid and narrow framework that may fit many people, but clearly, clearly does not fit all people. Thanks for listening to this What Could Go Right.